Bibles for our time of Bible study this morning to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been uh, studying in Acts, and I had the privilege in the meantime to uh, speak up in Marathon, and Manitouage, and um, in town, um, at uh, visiting with little little groups of Christians, and uh, I find that really refreshing, and I hope in my absence that your hearts have been touched too. Uh, I know Guido was here one Sunday, and, and he, I always enjoy listening to Guido, and um, there's just something about uh, someone with a gray head uh, that's walked with the Lord for 40 years uh, that uh, does something for your heart. So um, if you weren't here last Sunday uh, because you were playing golf or something, you missed out. <laughs> All right. Then anyway, this morning we were picking up with our study in the book of Acts in the 16th chapter. And I'd like to focus our attention this morning on verses 11 of this chapter to the last verse in the chapter. I don't believe we'll read all of it, but we will read portions of it. And my purpose in taking you through this passage of Scripture this morning is to encourage you from the example of a group of Christians that came into being. We have the record of it here. Through Paul's evangelistic efforts in northern Greece in 52 A.D., and a group of Christians that, according to the New Testament, was probably the most decent, problem-free, encouraging group of Christians that Paul had the privilege of knowing. In fact, a letter was written to these people. We have it later on in the New Testament known as the letter to the Philippians. Um, Philippi is located here on the map, approximately right there. This area is known as... Achaia, or Greece in the New Testament, and from about here up along the shore of the Aegean Sea, this is the Aegean Sea, it's an arm of the Mediterranean that sticks up into the land, uh, this is known as Macedonia. And today, this region of the world has been in the news very regularly for the last year. There's civil war going on in Yugoslavia here, right? And Albania is to the north, which up until just the last year or so has been one of the most closed countries in the world to the gospel. It's been a completely dominated country by the communist regime and, and, and the Serbs and the uh, Croats and uh, the Yugoslavs are all in fighting right now. And uh, this, this territory has throughout history been a source of uh, economic uh, and political and military upheaval. In the days of the Roman Empire there was a road that stretched right through Philippi, east-west across this peninsula of land known as Greece today and this this road was known as the Ignatian Way and it was one of the great major trade routes or traveling routes that the Romans established and of course this part of the Mediterranean to the west of Greece is known as the Adriatic Sea and then you have Italy just off the map and that was the headquarters of the Roman Empire and on Paul's mission, first missionary journey, he, he stayed over here in Asia Minor. On his second missionary journey, he traveled um, into northern Greece, into Macedonia, down into southern Greece, and then went back north and went over to Asia and uh, was responsible for establishing six or seven different churches. In fact, I counted it up for the first time recently. I think on his first missionary journeys, Paul went to ten cities, one island and went through four regions that are named but on this journey in which the church at Philippi was established he went to through seven different regions 16 specific cities and towns are mentions, mentioned and it was to this particular town that Paul wrote a later letter and he had an ongoing very happy relationship with these people I thought since we were going through the book of Acts that it would be 
very profitable for us in the next little while to focus on some of these churches that Paul established because we can learn a lot from them. This morning I'd like to focus on Philippi. The church at Philippi was very different from the church at Corinth or at Ephesus, other major churches that Paul established and wrote letters to. In fact, there are six or seven specific localities to which the Apostle Paul wrote pastoral letters after he had established an evangelistic uh, presence in these localities. And on this second journey, he established four churches to which we have letters written in the New Testament. And they are all different, and, and therefore they have each a different lesson to teach us. This morning in our study, I'd like to do three things. I'd, I'd like to tell the story of how the church at Philippi was founded. I'd like to bring a little bit of interesting historical background into that so that you see the significance of the story. I'd like to go through what little information we have about the church at Philippi in the rest of the New Testament to describe the nature of this church, to describe it, see what it's like, what were its key characteristics that made it distinct. And thirdly, I'd like to draw some lessons from this church to us. And so we're using the 16th chapter of Acts this morning as sort of like a springboard for our study. Most of our time will be spent, I believe, in the book of Philippians, and we'd like to integrate these two things together. We have the record in Acts chapter 16 of how the church came to existence, and then ten years later, or thereabouts, Paul wrote a letter to these same people, and that's recorded in the book of Philippians. And these two things must be taken together. The city of Philippi was originally a gold mining town. There's a, a mountain just south of the city, about one mile across a little creek that was probably the river mentioned right here in Acts chapter 16 where Paul had his first convert in this, out of this town that uh, was riddled with gold and silver mines. About four centuries before Paul came on the scene, this town was taken over by a very powerful dictator from Macedonia named Philip II of Macedon. And he became famous in ancient history because he was the first ruler of this part of the world to unite northern and southern Greece together through his military campaigns and through his uh, peace treaties that he established with the various little city-states. You have to remember that some of you may have taken in world history, as I did in grade 11, uh, about the Spartans and the Athenians and how that at that time um, these, little, these little towns, some of them were major towns, had their own armies and they controlled trade routes and, and uh, they set up their own laws. Well, this Philip of the Second united all of Greece about... Uh, the middle of the 300s before Christ, and he set the stage for his son, Alexander III, who became known in history as Alexander the Great, to <coughs> extend the power of the, Greece, of the Grecian kingdom across eastward um, and westward in the world and one of the great world empires out of, out of history. This, it was Alexander the Great's father that took control over this area. One of the first moves he did is he secured his western borders by a marriage alliance to the king of the area. And then he came with his armies and took over this town, which was originally known as Crenides, changed its name to Philippi in honor of himself, and uh, set his crews to work. And he took out as much as 10,000 talents of gold and silver out of that mine a year for the duration until it was exhausted. And uh, long before Paul came on the scene, there was no more gold and silver in that, that particular place. But that's a little bit of the, the background. About 75 years before Paul came on the scene, the Romans had assumed control of the area. And uh, the Roman Empire was now the world empire, the world power. And the, there was a, a rebellion within the ranks of the leadership of Rome. There were four generals, uh, or members of the Senate, I believe, that, uh, that, that had gone to civil war together. And uh, there was a great battle fought at Philippi, and the Republican, the, re the rebels were beaten out, and uh, Augustus Caesar 
uh, came to power. As a result of that battle, uh, the, for, the situation of the city of Philippi is just below a, a steep ridge where the narrow valley, which is where the road goes through, is a very strategically significant place. And as a result of, their, of this battle and of the, the Roman need for security in this part of their territory, they established a military outpost in Philippi, which is what you don't understand if you just read the biblical narrative. It was actually a Roman colony. A Roman colony with the name Colonia Augusta Julia Victrix Philipparum. And a Roman colony was always established as a miniature Rome. Um, it was considered to be a reproduction and an outpost of the capital city of the empire. They, they spoke Latin there. They used uh, Latin coinage. They had two chief magistrates who were appointed directly from Rome. The people who lived in Rome, who were Roman citizens, had all the rights and privileges of the people who lived in the capital of the Roman Empire, which were special privileges. So it was a very Roman place. And that probably explains why the Jewish ladies that were gathering for prayer were not gathering in their synagogue inside the city because the Jewish presence, Jewish religious presence, would have been very much frowned upon in a Roman colony with its own temple to Silvanus, the Roman god. And, and so that's why they were probably outside the city, secluded at the river, which was over a mile away from the, out the borders of the little town. And that's where Paul met these people and witnessed to them. The, uh, the two chief magistrates uh, of, in each Roman colony had specific duties and titles, and it appears from the language, from what I read, that the magistrates had uh, assumed a little bit broader control and, and authority than they normally did. These people apparently had let the power gone to their head. That's what you read in by the titles they gave to themselves, the greater titles than Roman magistrates normally had for a Roman colony. And that sort of explains why they, they overreacted to such a high degree when Paul did what he did in this town. So it wasn't just a Roman colony, but it was led by I, I don't think it would be too much to say extremists uh, in terms of the in the civil government. The uh, city of Philippi was actually divided into two. Uh, it was situated on a slope. There was a higher town and a lower town. In the upper town, divided from the lower town by this road, this famous road, the Via Ignatia, the upper town had the citadel, which was the Roman barracks. It had its Roman temple to the god Silvanus. And in the lower town, you had the marketplace, the forum, a small square where the courts of justice was located. And today, the only thing that presently exists from this ancient city of Philippi are four massive columns that probably held up the four corners of the forum in the lower town. So it's non-existent today. And uh, the significant thing is, is that into a town like this, the Apostle Paul arrives in 52 AD just about a year or two after the Jerusalem Council down in Jerusalem where the Jewish Christians had concluded that Gentile Christians didn't need to become Jewish in culture to become saved. The Jewish Christians had decided that. You, can re, you, know, you don't have to be circumcised and follow Jewish customs to become a Christian. And so with that good news, Paul and Timothy and, and Silas and his colleagues traveled around Asia and they crossed over the Adriatic Sea or the Aegean Sea and came to this town of Philippi. A very significant outpost in terms of the Roman Empire. Let's start reading from verse 11. Luke is writing this account and he's traveling with Paul. That's where the we comes from. Therefore, loosing from Troas, which is right here on the coast, on Asia Minor, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, obviously Neapolis is on the coast, and they have gone up the side of the hill, uh, up the edge of the mountains to this outpost of Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was accustomed to be made. In other words, they, took a, they walked for a mile to this little river where the Jewish believers prayed. 
we sat down and spoke to the women who resorted there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. It says that she was a believer. She was a religious person. Heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken by Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain maid, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who show to us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace, that's in the lower part of the town, to the rulers, brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, and you can imagine the uh, derision in their voices because these were all proud Romans, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, a model Rome, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. You can see this pride of Romanhood uh, coming out in the language. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, obviously, they were beaten 39 times. That was the standard Roman punishment. 39 times with uh, whips that had uh, multiple strands of leather to which were glued sharp objects. This was a terrible punishment half beaten to death, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. Do you think you would have been doing that? More than likely, would have been on intravenous in a hospital bed somewhere. They didn't have that option. The Lord obviously gave grace. And they sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. By the way, that fits with what people tell us about this region, that there are literally thousands of little mountaintops sticking out of the water. We call them islands all along this, the, the Greek shore in the Aegean. Any of you have ever seen pictures of Greece and travel brochures? It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, the, the Aegean Islands. But many of them are volcanic. Well, that's what happened that night. God saw to it in his sovereignty that there was a volcanic eruption and a, and a, and a great earthquake here to loose these men. The keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, why he would ask a question like that, I'm not sure. It's interesting why this Roman jailer would ask a question like that, unless he had a Jewish wife, <laughs> perhaps. I don't know. We could read in a lot there, but none of it would be certain. And Paul's response is one of the classic verses in the New Testament on salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord. They also spoke to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes. This man truly was converted in his thinking, his outlook. Was baptized, he and all his immediately. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. I won't read the last section at the moment, but I, I do want to focus, just recap for you the founding of this church at Philippi. 
In verses 11 and 12, Paul and his company are described as visitors in a city. It says they're there for certain days. So they come in and they case the joint. Verses 13 to 15a, it says that they realize that, uh, oh, there are some very religious people here. Remember Jews' methodology when, when, when not Jews. Do you remember Paul's methodology when he did evangelistic work? He gives it in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. To the Jews first, and also to the Greeks. And so Paul went into the town looking for Jews. This is a Roman colony. He doesn't find very many. And if they are, they're probably intimidated by the strong Roman presence, strong Roman worship, all this kind of stuff going on in this town. But he discovers that there are pious Jewish believers meeting outside of town by this river. He discovers this after being there for a while. So, the next thing we see them as, as witnesses on the Sabbath day by the river. Uh, Paul didn't mind going out and preaching in the country. So John Wesley wasn't, wasn't the first guy to preach in the country. Paul beat him to it. Right? Uh, we, we find here an admirable example of a adapting to the needs, uh, to the circumstances. And in verses 15b to 18, we have described here that after this one woman and her household believes, she invites Paul to be a guest in her house. She says in verse 15, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. She constrained us. She prevailed upon Paul and his company to, to actually stay in her house now and uh, and use that as their home base for their further outreach. But it says that in verse 16, as they went to prayer. I don't know. Likely this was going back out to the river because it says up in that earlier verse, in verse 13, that prayer was wont to be made. This is where the Jewish believers habitually met for prayer. So probably Paul was on his way every day out to this river to pray with the Jewish people and to speak to them and encourage them and challenge them and so forth. So he moves from being a visitor, casing the joint, from being a witness, speaking of Christ, to being a guest for a, a significant period of time. It doesn't tell us how long. It could have been weeks or months. But after a while, um, this one day came when things came to a head. And he got himself in trouble by casting a, a demon out of a girl that uh, was being exploited by businessmen in this town for her demonic gift. And since they couldn't make money on him anymore, they trumped up <laughs> charges and, you know, we've read the story. That didn't stop Paul. You know, first he witnessed on a riverbank and then he witnessed in a jail cell with his hands and his feet locked into an uncomfortable position in stocks in solitary confinement in the middle of the night after he's beat half to death, singing praises to God prayed and sang praises to God. It says the prisoners heard them. I have no doubts that many of the men that were in that jail probably trusted Christ that night, along with the jailer, having heard and, and seen what happened and <coughs> being naturally superstitious as people were in those days. And, you know, to, to have an earthquake happen just that night to these men. And the jailer humbles himself at the foot of these two Jews. You know, what a significant thing that, what an impression that would have made on these people, right? Undoubtedly, these people were affected, the prisoners. So it wasn't just the jailer and his house that got saved. But uh, we have Lydia and her house being saved. We don't know. It says she was from Thyatira. Thyatira is right in the center of Asia Minor, a very wealthy uh, industrious Asian woman is has an extra house over here in this Roman colony to do business. And if you do any study, you realize that in Macedonia, women had a much more open and revered position in Roman society than they did even in southern Greece. It was in Macedonia that women played a key role. And it's interesting that that is the true to form in the way the story is told here. And so these were who the, the converts were. They were Jewish, you know. We read into this that they were Jewish women, pious women, who, and, and, and her household that got saved, then very likely prisoners in a, out of this Roman prison, as well as this 
Roman uh, prison guard and his family. And it says in verse 40 at the end of this story that when uh, Paul was let out of the prison and had gone to Lydia's house, they saw the brethren, it says, plural, they comforted these brethren and departed them, and departed. And what you don't realize here, but you only read from the book of Philippians, is that the uh, Philippian Christians, when Paul left this town, were the only people that Paul had met in his whole journey that gave him money to help him in his travels. And they didn't just send him money this time, but when he went down to Thessalonica and stayed there, that it was this church that gave him money. It wasn't the Thessalonians that gave him money. It was a very giving bunch. And we read in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians from another place, that he's writing to these Corinthian Christians down here in southern Greece, and he's admonishing them to gather funds together for the famine that's going on down in Jerusalem down here for the saints down there who are suffering. And he says the people up in Macedonia, you know, they just, they gave of themselves. They just, they gave sacrificially a year ago. And here we've been waiting a year for you Corinthian Christians to give a little bit, you know, and Paul had to pry it out of them, you know, to really work on them to, to share consistently with their testimony that they were brothers in Christ with these other suffering Christians. And so everything we read about these Philippian Christians, that they were a very, uh, they were a suffering group, they were a very generous group, and uh, that really comes out in the book of Philippians. One interesting side note before we leave the founding of the church at Philippi, two things I want to mention. Uh, a French arche archaeological team went to Macedonia, to Philippi in particular, in 1864, and they uncovered a number of inscriptions on the uh, related to the temple area in, in Philippi, the Roman temple, to the god Silvanus. And they discovered the names of a number of men who had donated funds to build the temple and who were, who were members of a sacred college at Philippi. And here are their names. Cretans, Secundus, Trophimus, Urbanus, Aristobulus, Pudens, and Clemens. And every single last one of those individuals with those names turn out to be members of Paul's entourage after his second missionary journey as he travels back into Asia doing missionary work. Now, I don't know. You know, maybe there was more than one of each of these people by name, very common names possibly. But it's interesting that people who had these names became known as believers and traveled with Paul after his tour through. So Paul was, you know, it was a very fruitful evangelistic tour that Paul took through. Very, t very difficult, but very profitable. The nature of the church at Philippi. Just from the Acts 16 account, we realize that these these were his first converts in Asia, in, in Europe. Uh, the first converts were Jewish, then possibly prisoners, and then Romans. Some of them are mentioned when Paul writes his letter to the Philippian Christians in uh, the book of Philippians. He mentions uh, Clement and Euodia and Syntyche, and he mentions Epaphroditus, a man by the name of Epaphroditus had been sent from this town all the way across, probably across this road by ship to Rome, to a prison in Rome, where Paul was being held for his faith in 60 AD. And uh, it was the Philippian church that sent this man to minister. They, they probably brought food and clothing and medicine, whatever he needed. They sent this man, this one church, sent it over to Paul in Rome, in jail, and probably in solitary confinement for his faith. Uh, afterwards, Paul was undoubtedly released. And before he was released, he sent this man back to the church at Philippi to find out how they were doing because Paul really cared for these people. He didn't want them to be worried too much. There was a real love relationship between Paul and this church. This church is, is the kind of church that we all wish we belonged to and, uh, and that everybody's looking for. You're looking for a church where people really love one another. You're looking for a church where people care for one another. You're, you're looking for a church that, that has 
great evangelistic zeal. You're looking for a church who has a, a vital, ongoing, a reverent, respectful relationship with its resident Christian leaders where there's no infighting going on and cliques being formed. That's the kind of church this was. It was a suffering church. It was persecuted. Paul talks in the first chapter of Philippians in, chapter, in verses 28 and 29 about them not being terrified by their adversaries. And it's very obvious that these Christians were persecuted in this Roman town with this Roman hype uh, for, its, for its false religion and so forth. As a class of people, most of these people in, Ro in Philippi were poor. Paul mentions that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, that they were impoverished, yet it was the poorest Christians that Paul knew that gave the most when they were confronted with the needs. And characteristically, that is true even today. It's not rich Christians that give so much to the Lord's work. It's usually the, uh, the poor Christians that, that have hearts for the Lord that are the, going to be the ones that respond to the needs. Only two times in the New Testament does Paul ever speak of having a deep longing for a group of Christians, once to the Romans, once to the Philippians. Um, this church was known as an obedient church. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, you have always obeyed. If you read through the book of Philippians, you, you won't discover one single major problem in the church. The closest thing that they had to a problem at Philippi, from what we know from the book of Philippians, is that two ladies mentioned in the fourth chapter seem to be at one another weren't getting along very well. And so Paul urged, he says, I beseech Euodia and Syntyche that they be of one mind. Right? But Paul didn't come down on them for false doctrine, for cliques in the church, for division, for bad attitudes, for worldliness, for anything. This was a good, good living, obedient group of Christians. Paul had often taught them. Apparently, after he came through the first time, he had at least two other encounters with these Christians in his second missionary journey, and again on his third missionary journey as well. About 40 years after Paul wrote his letter to these Christians, a man by the name of Ignatius, who was a church leader from from uh, Central Asia, a man by the name of Ignatius, was, was being escorted to Rome where he was martyred as a Christian leader. And it's, he's, it's the only incident in subsequent history that we have to the city of Philippi, the church at Philippi, that this church leader stopped in his travels, met these Christians at Philippi, and he was reverently welcomed by the Christians. This is... Um, this is many years later, so the church did last for quite a while, and it was uh, re retained its spirituality and its sense of concern. And we know about this because they struck up correspondence with a, re with a, a bishop by the name of Polycarp, who lived close to Ignatius in Asia Minor. And uh, that's the last mention that we have of Philippi in, in recent church history. So that's the nature of the church at Philippi, uh, a mixed group, uh, a poor group, a godly group, a spiritually mature group, a loving group, had very close ties with the Apostle Paul. Um, no other church in the New Testament days that Paul had anything to do with had such a, a, a loving, caring, ongoing relationship. So let's move thirdly to the lessons that we can learn from the church at Philippi having drawn a sort of a picture for you of what it was like a little bit, I think there are four or five key things that we can take with us to encourage and challenge ourselves this morning. Let's turn to the book of Philippians. From the first to last in the book of Philippians, that this, this is actually just a letter, Paul is referring to the joy that he had as a Christian leader. To the joy that he had as a Christian leader. And you know what brought Paul a great joy? 
It was the fact that these were the kind of people that they were. Now, this is a, a self-evident point. It doesn't need to be belabored by me or anyone else, really. I just wanted you to see it from the terminology of the Scriptures themselves. In verse 4 of this book, the fourth verse, Paul says, I thank my God on every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day till now. He was writing about ten years after he had founded the church. For, for the last ten years of his Christian experience, every time Paul thought of the Philippians, it sparked him inside. It just did something for him. He was, it was the way he encouraged himself. He was made happy by the reflections every time of he thought about these Christians. In the fourth chapter and in the tenth verse, at the end of the book, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last, ten years later, your care of me has flourished again, of which you were all so mindful, but you lacked opportunity. Paul's in jail be separated by a land mass and by prison walls and by uh, an arm of the Mediterranean Sea by great distance and he discovers through the personal encouragement that this church sent embodied in, the, in a member of their congregation named Epaphroditus that they really cared for him still and that they were the only people that seemed to look out for him and Paul refers to this great joy these people have brought to him can I just say something that seems self-evident the way you are and the way I am as a Christian either brings other people joy or a bit or or a bitter taste in our mouth. Yeah. And and how wonderful it is to be able to have the kind of reputation and testimony where we bring other people joy. I can only encourage all of you to purpose in your hearts to do that. To have that kind of let's try to emulate the example of the Philippian church where we you know, anytime anybody comes in contact with us, that the net result of our contact with that person is joy in other people's lives. I can name names of people that do that for me. Right? I can also say from first-hand experience and from talking with people, you know, I, I can name names of people that, that are just bitterly upset and frustrated and angry at the contact they've had with other Christians. It happens all the time. Let us work at being the kind of people that produce joy in our interrelationships with others. A second lesson I would like to bring out of the Philippian church comes from verse 9 in this book. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Paul is writing. Verse 8, he says, God is my witness. How greatly I long after you all in the tender mercies of Jesus Christ. And he says, This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense of the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is remarkable. It really is remarkable. It reminds me of something I read in First Thessalonians, and that's going to be reserved for another message. And I noticed this years ago that to the Thessalonian Christians and here in these verses to the Philippian Christians, you know what Paul, Paul is like a sponge. He's never satisfied. It's almost like Paul is never satisfied. You can never do enough to satisfy Paul. These Christians never attained to a level where Paul wrote to them and said, I think you people finally reached the epitome of Christian experience. I think you've made it. You're perfectly loving, perfectly discerning, perfectly everything you are you have arrived no Paul never never once in his writings ever indicates such a thing to the Philippian Christians he says you people are a loving bunch you're doing great I have nothing ill to write to you people you are well on your way to continuing on as you have been taught from the beginning you're an obedient great bunch of Christians guess what you haven't arrived yet <laughs> Keep loving more, he says. What a, what a lesson. What a lesson. If there's one thing that none of us have ever yet been able to do, it's love like we should have loved. Right? It's 
to have come to a place of discernment in our experience that we should have already come to years before. And this is what this is a, a, a very important lesson. Not that we should be discouraged by it, but we should realize that by the nature of our case, we are frail people. We are limited by our natural limitations, our fleshly nature we carry around with us day by day, right? And what God wants to work, do is work in our lives that we would abound more and more in love. And Paul describes this love two different ways. And this is also part of this key lesson here. It's not that we should just love more. But if we love more, that's described a certain way. He says, in knowledge and all judgment. Now, there's a difference between knowledge and judgment. Judgment is the word for discernment in the Greek. Right? What do you think comes first? Knowledge or discernment? Do you think discernment comes before knowledge? Now, it's kind of a tricky question. Of course, discern you have to have discernment to know something. You have to discern a little piece of knowledge, right, before you can get more and more and more. But to, ha to have a, a characteristic of being a discerning person, a well-rounded discerning person, requires knowledge first, right? Now, Paul attaches that to love. Right? Some per some, I'm sure that it's happened that some Christian thought that they could show love to a person by doing this. Right? Uh, I've heard of... Uh, people that thought they were being loving by just pounding on other Christians. Just pounding on them. Just, you know, criticizing and, and being ignorant uh, and very tactless. They, they thought that they were just doing what that person needed the best, so they were, they were loving that person. Right? Well, if, you know, what I'm, what, I, what I'm taking out of this is that the more you love, the more it requires that you need to know more so that you can love more and, and you need discernment to be able to love more and more and more and more and more. I think that's what Paul means here, that your love may abound in knowledge and in discernment, ultimately that you may approve things that are excellent. You'll be able to d discern between the fine issues that confront Christians, that you may ultimately be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. We as Christians are like, like, like adolescents. Adolescents are like big kids, right? They're not quite adults, but you know they got the body of an adult, the mind of a kid, or somewhere in between, right? And they want to do so bad, but when they do, they don't have the knowledge and the discernment to get themselves into troubles, right? Like bumbling fools, they'll fall into this problem and never, never realize what they're doing. They just fall into it. They just want to do so bad, right? Can you picture that? The more we love as Christians, the more we grow in spiritual love as Christians, that will happen as we gain knowledge and true discernment, ultimately so that we won't be making these bad mistakes, so that we won't be offending people needlessly, so that we don't make gross errors in our attempts to serve Christ, in our attempts to show love to others. That's, to me, that was an important lesson from the Philippians, especially when they were doing it right to begin with. They were already people and Paul says that's not good enough keep working harder at it right sure be encouraged realize